Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pre-Shift, Tidbits of Wisdom for Everyday Service. My name is TJ Griffin, and I'm the Corporate Wine Educator for Winebow. We welcome your questions at any point during the webinar, but please use the Q&A rather than the chat bar to submit them. Now, let me introduce your host, Master Sommelier Ron Edwards is the husband of one wife, the father of five girls, a surfer, and missionary kid. He has over 29 years of hospitality experience, and since 2018, he has been the Director of Wine Education for Winebow. Now, here to discuss today's topic, the value of technique, Master Sommelier Ron Edwards. Well, hello, TJ. Thank you hello, for the Ron. introduction. Good to hear your voice, as always. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in this week. Uh, we're going to talk about an important part of hospitality today, and that's technique. And this really kind of applies to almost all professions, right? There's a huge difference between knowledge and then how you apply it in, in every case. And in the case of hospitality, the real difference here is, the, is that we need to um, sort of combine two things, and that is the attitude of hospitality needs to be complemented and bolstered by good technique. And so what we're going to talk about today is some of the service acumen techniques that are, are part and parcel of being a great hospitality professional in the dining room. Now, obviously, there are different sets of techniques if you're the front desk person or if you're um, a concierge in a hotel or all the other opportunities of hospitality. This one is centered on the idea of restaurant service. So um, tune in for that. And obviously, if you are in the restaurant industry, then apply it. If you're a, someone who likes to frequent restaurants, then you can um, put yourself in the in the driver's seat when you entertain yourself to make sure you're getting the best service possible. Not by complaining, but noticing the difference between uh, restaurants that offer you a really warm experience and, uh, and restaurants that offer you that plus the memorable uh, techniques. And so combining attitude and practical technique and efficiency of function are really, really important. So Ron, a question for you that uh, hopefully you can answer here. So I, I had a restaurant career. I was, I, and I practiced formal level of service for the certified level for the court of master, master sommelier's exams. As I'm sure there's many people on the call that have uh, some experience with the court and that level of service, but I never had to use that level of formality in my restaurant career. So why do we, why do we aspire to that? Why do we learn that formal level? Well, I think it's sort of the concept of why do you learn the English language or any language that, for that matter, in its proper grammatical structure and good spelling and all of that, when most of your communication is going to happen by text or instant messaging or something where it's a phrase and it hardly has any structure at all. And I think the reality is that if you learn how to do it the right way, you can always dial it back to the need applied, right? Uh, so in the case of is technique, technique is always formal, right? No, no not, not at all. Uh, but good technique can be applied in any scenario. One of the things that I think a master sommelier should be able to do is walk into a truly formal dining room setting, even something like, a, you know, um, even Buckingham Palace per se, and be able to perform the function of a sommelier appropriately in that setting, but also be able to walk into uh, Joe's Diner down the street, and if they sell wine, to be able to serve someone there, keep them comfortable, and um, still use te the techniques that make sense in that environment. But you got to know those techniques before you can implement them uh, appropriately given the dining room. Does that uh, sort of solve that problem for you? Yeah, so it sounds like you have to know the rules before you can break them kind of thing. Yeah, sort of. And um, and how to break them. And how to break them properly. Like the classic idea of walking clockwise around the table won't work at a booth, will it? Serving everyone from the right with the beverage won't work in a booth either. We're going to get to that. So there are just some situations that the exact textbook example of that technique isn't going to apply to that dining room, but it's a great time to implement it sometimes anyway. So, you know, formal settings technique is absolutely critical because in a formal setting, not only are people expecting to have a very hospitable experience where you make them warm and fuzzy about the way you treat them, but they're also expecting you to do your job with grace and style. And so knowing these techniques becomes even more important 
how you apply them there because they're expected. In casual settings, this offers you a huge impact because walking into a casual setting, we want to feel warm and fuzzy about the hospitality, but we're often not looking for that good technique that suddenly sets a casual setting or a semi-formal setting apart because the staff there can turn that on as well. And then all of a sudden it's a wow experience when you thought you were just going to have a, a good experience. Okay. So where do we start with, with technique, Ron? I think we start with some basic elements. And by the way, just so everybody knows, this is going to be a two part um, series because if I went through all of it, it was just a little too long. And so this segment may be a little shorter than our past ones, but I'm sure everyone won't mind. So to me, the elements of service technique begin in body posture. And I put the picture in the background there of, of uh, military men standing at attention, not because you should be standing at attention, but that their posture is appropriate to their job. Uh, and so when we talk about service posture, we're talking about the way your body is in relationship to the guest. And so in in the case of standing up straight and tall, certainly, unless you're tall, then maybe standing up straight and tall is too imposing to the guest. Um, so I'm 6'1", and when I put on you know formal dining room shoes, I might be 6'2", if they have a heel. And somebody sitting down at a table, at the and I'm standing at the corner because dining rooms are relatively tight, I'm like making them stretch their neck up at me and it probably feels a little weird. So for me, the proper posture is to stand just a smidge back from the table and bend at the waist a little bit to make myself more like 5'10 or 5'9, something a little less imposing. Uh, if you are, you know, maybe 5'5, five, five, then you walk up to the table straight and tall, shoulders back, looking confident and proud without looking like you're stiff. That's one of those examples. Another is the orientation of the guest. Um, where do I stand to do what, right? So, um, and then last is the actual function. So those three beginning elements um, are where we're gonna talk about uh, service technique today and next time. So let's at least deal with the next topic, which is, you know, right, right, left, basically. Um, so when you're taking the order, when you're talking to the guest, you're on their right-hand side. Um, I'd love to give you all the history as to why exactly this is true. It starts all the way back into um, medieval and Renaissance times when, you know, service was done by those who weren't allowed to be to speak unless spoken to and all of those kind of things. And it was a very formal and, and sometimes dangerous environment for someone without a lot of rights, right? The, the serfs doing the serving weren't always respected very much. But in However it developed, that's part of it, but however it developed, now it's an expectation that makes people comfortable when you meet their expectation, they, they relax more, right? And so if you have a staff that does the entire dining room the same way, then the guest expects it that way and it makes sense. Now, um, in practical setting, it's not always possible to walk all the way around the table to take orders. And a lot of tables are too tight, but in a dining room that allows you to, to go from the host's right to the next person to the next person. Uh, all of that makes it, makes it very seamless. They don't have to yell across the table. You can have a closer conversation with them. So we take our orders from the right. That's food and beverage orders. When we are serving beverages and when we're clearing anything from the table, we do it from the right with the right hand. Um, if we are taking plates, meaning food items, things that are going to the table to be consumed, that are not beverages, they come in from the left with the left hand. So yes, we have to be uh, adept at using both hands. We need to be able to move around the table uh, from uh, right to left. In an ideal scenario, you're gonna go clockwise around the table. And if you have a dining room that's spaced out enough where people can walk clockwise around the dining room and clockwise around the table, there's a side benefit for that, TJ, and that is less breakage because the chaotic nature of service is reduced to a more minimal nature. It's always gonna be there underlying, waiting to, to erupt. But if your entire staff is trained to walk clockwise around the table and clockwise from table to table, there's a flow of, of business that happens as they go from guest to guest, as they go from table to table, that's predictable. So there's less running into people, there's less change of direction unexpectedly, and therefore less drops, spills, and noise, breakage, and therefore better profitability. So if you can train 
your dining room staff to think clockwise, you will actually probably make your bonus a little faster when those things become available again, because you'll have less breakage on the floor. So reviewing, taking the order from the right, we clear and serve beverages. And so we serve beverages from the right and we clear all things from the right with the right hand. And then plates we deliver with the left from the left side. And if you can get that down in your dining room, there'll be a lot less chaos and a whole lot more um, peace. Now, well, but Ron, this is the real world and we don't have those kind of dining rooms. We have these kind of dining rooms. This is the no elbow rule, right? So we have booths, we have tables we can't walk around. Some in the, din the dining room that I consulted in the most last, there were tables that you could not move from chair to chair. You had to reach from one corner to everybody um, because we had a very small space and we needed to maximize every square foot for uh, income. And, you know, especially in larger cities, this is a very common theme no elbow to the guests. So if you have to serve a beverage, for instance, to your right and you're standing with the guests, then you need to use your left hand so that your body is open to them so that they do not get your right elbow in, your, in their face while you're pouring wine to them. So basically, if you're standing on the corner of the table, you've got two guests on your right and two guests on your left, or you're standing at a booth and you're right in the middle of the table, you're going to pour the guests on your right with your left hand, and you're going to pour the guests on your left with your right hand and serving food similarly make sense yes yeah, so that that's was going to be my question because we i've worked in places where you might have a section where you have a conventional table it might be a booth a banquette some high top they're against the wall yep. uh, i've waited on tables that i can't even reach to certain spots uh so other than the elbows rule is there something you need to be concerned about when yeah uh, i think the add to that is doing everything you can not to in invade the guest space. I mean, every part of the world has their own um, assessment of what personal space is, right? So in the US, personal space is about 18 inches. Obviously during COVID-19, it's six feet, but 18 inches in a normal world in the United States. Well, in, in Asia, it's like nine inches or a foot or something like that. It's much smaller. So your guest is going to be a different level of sensitivity to you getting in their space. But it never feels good to be like crowded by their interpretation. So even when you cannot serve all the way around the table, you need to use as little of your body in their way as possible, which is a lot easier if you're, if you're have long arms. Right. But if you don't, and then the rest of it is they know that you have to do it the way you're doing it because they can see the scenario too. Just be kind about it. And uh, once or twice, not every time, but at the beginning, apologize. I'm so sorry. We, I will have to reach across here uh, to take care of this for you. And then they're just going to expect it. And, you know, apologizing every time will get annoying. So you don't want to go in a play by play apology either. All right. Next oh. topic. <laughs> Ron, have you ever seen those uh, those competitions where they have to race with a full tray of drinks? I have watched those, and I'm <laughs> glad that I haven't participated in them because I'm pretty good with a tray, but I, I've never tried to run with one, especially not with liquid. Oh, that would be my nightmare. I, trays make me uh, nervous when they're packed with drinks filled to the, to the brim. They're, what? Yes, trays make it the argument for the stemless glassware that I hate. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nonetheless, um, so let's talk about trays. Trays are a necessary part of your repertoire in restaurants. And, and I'm sad that a lot of restaurants have eliminated trays. And I'm not exactly sure why they did that. It's, it adds to the efficiency of service. And when you use a tray well, it really demonstrates that you have a skill level. And certainly there's the opportunity to use it poorly and spill things and even drop things on, on people. Um, I've been there. I was a server that a plate slid off a big tray and landed on a table. My, it happened to my daughter one day where it slid off the tray because she stacked it improperly and the plate landed on the guest head. Uh, same restaurant I was consulting in. That was a bad day. Um, I've, I've been the one to spill a champagne flute or whatever on a tray, but nonetheless, those are the anomalies and the, the efficiency of using trays in dining rooms is well worth the effort. So why a tray? For all those reasons, it's a platform from which to serve. It gives you a, a way to serve four people without running back and forth and getting help, etc. You need to carry your beverage trays in your left hand. Now, a food service tray 
where you're going to take it out and put it on a tray jack or a tray stand somewhere and then serve from it. You could carry in either training. But you know, if, if you're going to serve beverages from the right, then you got to be able to carry the tray in the left. And so being able to carry the tray in left hand is essential. Being able to handle it in both hands is amazing. I am not that good. So um, left hand, um, lined. This is a great picture. I found this one. I was like, yes, the tray is lined. Now he's got a really nice stainless steel or silver tray and he's lined it with linen. And the reason he's done that is it's really slippery without it. If you use one of those fiberglass trays, the reason you cover it up is it's just plain ugly. Um, and then if you don't have the option of covering it, cause you don't have that option in your restaurant, fine, then they wouldn't expect you to cover it. But any place that has linen or nap, uh, or serviettes to use for wine service, et cetera, should, should cover their trays. Um, you're going to serve with your right hand. The magic of the tray is not bending at the waist because when you bend at the waist, if you've ever had a full glass of anything and bent over at the waist, like I did the other night here in the house, you realize that your arms don't bend and adjust with you and you spill your drinks. Well, that's how champagne flutes and this glass that's in this gentleman's tray is going to fall over. Um, so you're bending at the knees, doing a little bit of a curtsy technique so that the tray is staying level with you as you go up and down with your knees and then serving from there. Cause you also are gonna have a heck of a time if you're much more than say, I don't know, five, six, standing straight up and serving a glass of anything to the table without adjusting the tray. So, um, and then last of it, uh, you know, if you're wearing, if you're in tray service, sensible shoes are a beautiful thing um, because anything with a hard heel makes you jar a little bit more when you walk. Um, a high heel for uh, those who wear those can be a challenge. I'm amazed that anybody can walk in them, but to, to watch an accomplished server whose uniform involves heels, like I've seen at a few cocktail bars and things like that, it's like, how do you do that? Um, a lot of practice. The, the softer walk you have, the better off you are. And uh, this is also a fabulous, it, not only is it for delivery, but it also makes it so you can clear glassware efficiently and cleanly. Um, because I don't know about you, but one of the marks of good technical servers is that you never see them get anywhere near the rim of your glass. Their fingers are never where people's lips have been. Uh, so that's really a key thing with, with trays. If you don't have a tray, you tend to see restaurants that don't have trays and they use the claw technique in people's glasses as they clear tables and, and, and it makes me cringe and my stomach turn upside down. Ah. Uh. So my, my terror is the tray, but for a lot of, uh, I've seen over the years, especially new servers can be absolutely terrified about opening a bottle of sparkling wine. Yeah. And honestly, I don't blame them, nor do I want them to feel overly comfortable with it. I would rather they be a little bit scared of it than to do a lot of what I've seen through the years. Um, a bottle of sparkling wine, if it's a full champagne method, has about six atmospheres of pressure, five to six atmospheres of pressure in it. And it definitely can shoot a cork around the room, bounce it off the ceiling, hit a guest in the side of the head, hit you in the head. Uh, it can break things if there's a shelf nearby. There's lots of reasons to be very careful with sparkling wine. Um, and that once you understand the technique, it's not nearly as scary or as complicated as people make it. So I'm just gonna walk through it here. I wish, um, I wish I was just playing you a video, but we're going to talk about it step by step. And if you then replay this from YouTube later, you can have one in your hand and walk through it with you. One of these days, I'm going to record this, uh, the motions and everything so that it's available for our staff and, and our friends in the industry. Um, but the idea is what, what do you need to open sparkling wine? Obviously, you need the bottle of sparkling wine and you want it to be cold. You don't want one of those cellar temperature sparkling wines when you go to open it at a table because that's bad news. The warmer it is, the more explosive it is. So as you're gathering everything else, put it in the ice bin. So hopefully you have ice buckets in your restaurant. If you're selling sparkling wine, you should. Uh, you want ice and water because you want the water, you want the bottle to be able to slip through the layer of ice down to the bottom and stay cold. The ideal scenario is an ice bucket on stand. Even when I was running casual restaurants, I still had ice buckets with stands because there's no space on the table for an ice bucket when you have four people. So you need to put it somewhere. Uh, there was a formal restaurant in which I worked where we had ice buckets and stands, but we also had uh, service stations off to the side for wine and beverages. So sometimes they sat there. The idea is that this much stuff shouldn't be on a table if there's four people there. You can use a corner if there's two and it's a four top. Uh, you need two coasters. 
And that could be a bread and butter plate. You don't necessarily have to have wine specific coasters in your restaurant that I've had them in the past. They tend to disappear in people's pockets and purses, which is really distracting. But nonetheless, a, a white b and plate is just fine. One for the bottle, one for the cork. You'll need your corkscrew, especially the corkscrew with a knife. Any, any good, what they've always called a waiter's corkscrew, um, the ones that fold up and have a knife. And you need all those things for this. And you're like, but wait a minute, those the sparkling wines have a tab. Yeah, but most of them don't work very well. And even if they do, they may not cut it right where you want it. All right, you're going to make the presentation with the bottle from the right side. So you're going to have the bottle in your hands, have the serviette behind it. You're going to present the bottle to the guests, say the name. Uh, vintage or non-vintage, get them to approve. And then uh, you're going to move that serviette from the bottle, from behind the bottle into your hand. I always keep them on my middle fingers of my left hand because I grip the bottle with my right hand. So there's the opening hand and the non-opening hand. For me, I'm, I'm only able to do this with my right hand. So I put I, I hold my fingers like this and put the towel over and I call it mom's, mom's towel rack like it used to be under my mom's sink. And I keep the I keep the linen there now, and I've got a hold of the bottle, and I have I'm cutting the the foil, and then up through the center is the magic cut to make sure you release the foil, take it off, put the foil in your pocket. Now I'm going to put my hand around the neck of the bottle and my thumb on top. Once that is there, I'm putting I'm taking the napkin and put it underneath my thumb. It's a folded linen; it doesn't need to look like a parachute. It just makes it hard to work. But the purpose of the linen is a parachute. It'll slow the cork down if it does get away from you, and it'll control any spray that happens should you um, open it a little too fast. Now we're going to pull up the tab. There's a tab on every sparkling wine cage, and those, it's amazing, international standards, six half turns or three full turns counterclockwise will loosen every cage on the planet. How we can do that and not have one single um, cell phone platform is amazing, isn't it? All right, so six half turns, wiggle. Going to make sure that it's loose around the edge. You've got your thumb pushing down on this really hard, and you're holding the bottle at a 45-degree angle. Now I'm going to move your hand to the bottom of the bottle. I recommend this. You can hold it this way, but often you've pulled it out of an ice bin. Most restaurants use polyspun linen, which move water around but don't dry anything off. So you're better off down here where you can have the, the ridges in the bottom of the bottle to hold on to, and you can grip it here. Okay, I've got it. 45 degree angle. Now I'm going to move my index finger, my forefinger up to my thumb, and I'm going to start twisting the bottle. Little quarter, eighth turns even, just back and forth. I'm going to start to feel the cork start to move out. Note my hand on the cork is staying steady. I'm using the wrench of the bottle to do the work. When it gets to where it's starting to move, I'm going to push my hand towards well, away from me a little bit, so that as the cork starts to come out, it's gonna come out first at an angle towards me. And if you control it as it's doing that, it'll come out with this sound. Instead of, you don't want that sound. That's, that's not good technical skill. That little perfectly inaudible is the preference. After that, you're gonna put the bottle on the coaster because that way you're not gonna drop something when you're nervous. You're gonna take the cork and the cage apart. The cage goes in your pocket, the cork goes on the other coaster. At that point, you pick up the bottle, you wipe the lip, and you pour a taste for the host. He approves, she approved, and then you go clockwise around the table, ladies first, men second, unless there's a preference that is otherwise at your restaurant, that's classic service. <laughs> now, um, just make sure that you pour enough that they can enjoy it, not more than is needed, and then put the bottle in the ice bucket or ask them if they'd like it on the table, depending on their preference. The, the, the real skill here is when you get a table of six or eight that wants to share one sparkling wine bottle as a toast, being able to get that exact same pour all the way around the table. Pouring is a huge skill. It's not about glug, 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 and it's not about pouring half a bottle into two glasses so that you can force them to order another bottle because they won't. They'll just be mad. Ron, we have a question about that. Okay. Uh, from Emlyn, what do you suggest we do with the cage? Uh, it's a great question, Emlyn. The, the cage is 
a couple of things. It's not very pretty. There are those fun little capsules on the inside. If a guest is collecting them, they may ask for them. But in general, they're just sharp wire. And the best place to put them is in your server apron or in your coat pocket if you're wearing a jacket or anywhere except on the table. Uh, the, the capsule, the, the, the metal capsule, and that we just consider trash and, and away it goes. It never goes in the ice bucket, even though I've seen people do it. That is not where it belongs. That, that is one of those things that says, I don't know technical service when I put the trash in the ice bucket. Now, what about, you, you say you have the, the cork is on the table, like how long would you leave that uh, on the table for them? Great question. Um, so you finish pouring and everybody's happy. You excuse yourself from the table with something pleasant like enjoy your sparkling wine, enjoy your champagne. I'll be back in a moment to talk about wine for the rest of the evening, or I'll be back in a moment to take your dinner orders. May I take the cork with me? And then it goes away with you. Some people will say, no, I, I want to keep it, in which case it, it stays, but it stays on that plate. If you come back to the table and you're cleaning things up because table maintenance is part of next week um, and it's happened to lay somewhere else, pick it up and put it back on the plate. The main reason for that is that it's round, it rolls, and it can get hidden underneath or behind it, someone's point of view, and they go to set something down on the table, and it gets partially on the cork and partially on the table, and you have a nasty spill, either from one of the servers that's helping you yourself or one of your guests, and none of it, none of the, doesn't matter who does it, it's a mess that has to be cleaned up and an unpleasant end to somebody's otherwise great evening. All right, one more question about uh, sparkling wine. Okay. How, one of the ways to become comfortable is to do it, of course, right? Right. Uh, but champagne can be expensive, as mm -hmm. uh, a lot of sparkling wines can be expensive. Is there, is there a way to practice uh, so that you, until you feel comfortable, so that you're not uh, nervous in front of a guest? Yes. Um, make it policy at your personal residence that you open wine once a week in your residence that you're going to enjoy that happens to be sparkling and has a cage in a cork. That's rule number one, because it's just wine with bubbles in it. And Thursday is just as good for that as it would be for anything else you're opening that day. And there are value, there are value oriented sparkling wines that have corks and cages like Prosecco and Cava uh, that are, are about the same price as what people spend for Thursday night wine. The, the, the restaurant specific option is to Make sure that your bartender knows that anytime they open a bottle for wine by the glass or they're getting ready to use it for making cocktails, that they notify you um, and that you would like to open it because you want the practice. And last but certainly not least, make it your personal mission to sell sparkling wine so that you can open it as often as possible. As I talked about in the first 30 seconds, the first 30 seconds at the table for me I want to put champagne on the table, either by the glass or in a bottle, because I think it'll change the tone of the entire evening right there. Um, but that's just a personal thing. So in general, everyone should just try to drink more bubbles. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's the summation of it all right there. <laughs> all right. Well, if we don't have any further questions coming in, uh, our next uh, pre-shift is in two weeks on September 22nd, same time, three o'clock Eastern time. And it's service technique continued. So more, uh, more in depth uh, about bottle service, Ron? Yeah, we're going to talk about um, still wine bottle service. We're going to talk about decanting. And I think we're going to talk about table maintenance, which is um, this, the, the, the mark of really great servers is that you sit there the evening and your table stays clean no matter what you do to it they're back cleaning it up after you that's a huge that's a huge experience thing that they've figured out how to have time to maintain the table in a clean orderly way in addition to all the other responsibilities of servers in sections well i look forward to seeing that thank you all for joining us join us again in two weeks until then, stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. See y'all later.